Today we're going to continue with the theme of is there a day for the return of Christ. It's going to be the 22nd part and once again it's going to be a video that we are going to show. Before we get into details, as always, let's start with a prayer. Our Father, we want to ask you, Lord, that you will continue to help us to understand more about this theme that is so extremely important for all of us, for the generation that has reached the end of the age. That is why we want to ask you, Lord, to enlighten us, help us to have more knowledge of everything you want to tell us, to prepare us to endure until the end, if it is your will, and at least, at the very least, to continue giving testimonies to many more people with many more arguments, solid, clear, forceful, so that many more wake up. Touch the hearts of everyone you can and help us to be useful to you, as useful as you want. Forgive, forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name we ask you, Amen. Well, as usual, let's start with a biblical text that will help, help us focus on today's topic. The topic that you will see today is a topic that my brother Joseph San Vicente presented, but he presented it extracted from a PowerPoint that is not his. Later we'll comment on who it is, but you're going to see how it's going to be a key essential place to be able to begin to determine the moment of sin's entry into the world on the 6,000 years of history. And let's look at it from the perspective of a question that has been going around so many times. Christians, of course. How long did Adam go without sinning? Was it the day after he was created? Was it after a week? Was it after... How long? Once we understand how long Adam goes without sinning, it'll help us to also be able to situate a whole plot, which is the key to understanding the moment of Christ's return. But... Since that has to do with Adam and with Christ, let's look for a biblical text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where he talks about this union of the two characters and with a background that will now give us even more understanding about the text and about the theme we are dealing with. We'll start by reading from this the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians from verses 12 to verse 26. But if it is preached that Christ rose from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? For if there is no resurrection of the dead, neither is Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, then your preaching is vain. Your faith is also vain. And we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that He raised up Christ, whom He did not raise up, unless indeed the dead are raised. For if the dead are not raised, neither is Christ raised. And if Christ is not raised, your faith is, vain, is in vain, you are still in your sins. Then also, those who fell asleep in Christ appear, if in this life we hope, only in Christ, we are the most pitiable of men. But now Christ has risen from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It is done. And before I go any further, I'll stop here. Look at how in the beginning the Apostle Paul is speaking to the Corinthians the inhabitants of that city of Corinthian, who converted to Christianity, who are left with a margin of doubt because of the movements of people who spoke of Jesus not being resurrected. Where did this come from? Well, evidently from all those Jews who didn't 
want to accept Christ as the Messiah and spread everywhere that Jesus hadn't risen. And let's remember how in the Gospels it was spoken. That they said to the Roman soldiers, Say that your disciples have come, and what have they done? The body has already been stolen. Therefore, this belief expressively spread served to put it in the context of the society of that time. That Jesus had, hadn't really risen, and there were living testimonies that it, it was so. Jesus was resurrected. If Jesus is not resurrected, what is the use of any hope of us? of ours. It's in vain because if he rises from dead, that's the guarantee that we're going to be resurrected. Then, if you only believe in Christ and he doesn't rise, what's the point? We wouldn't be safe. We'd go on, and he says, in our sins. So, as a consequence, he gives a whole dissertation, an association of concepts, which is very interesting. Now let's see how he keeps telling us afterwards. If in this life we only hope in Christ, we are the most pitiable of all men, but now Christ has risen from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep are made. That is, it's a fact. He's risen. But what does he keep saying? For just as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. By reaching his own altar, Christ, the firstfruits, then those who are Christ at his coming. Notice how interesting this topic is. On the one hand it says that in Adam everyone dies. Why? Because Adam sinned and sin is passed down for generations to all mankind. So what happens to all of us? We sin, therefore we die. We die. It is our condemnation. And here he compares, he compares us Adam to Christ, if all die with one, with Christ, all will, make, all will be made alive. But I don't know if you've noticed a very important detail, that people who believe in the immortality of the soul, that when you die, you already swarm somewhere, verse 33 tells us, but each one in his due order, that of being quickened, Christ, the first fruits, then those who are Christ's at his coming. He doesn't say... When they die, they're already made alive because they're going to heaven. At his coming, when Jesus returns for the second time, therefore, gentlemen, who believe in the immortality of the soul, study your Bibles thoroughly, because if you believe that, you are contradicting a divine message. And see how he continues. Then, the end, when he will give the kingdom to God and the Father, when he will have done away with all dominion, all authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that will be destroyed is death. The last enemy. Notice how automatically it makes us a relationship. Adam on the one hand, Christ on the other, and the background, what is it? Life or death, resurrection, ultimate prize, award, or losing you forever. And it doesn't end here. Look, if we go now to verse 45, what does it tell us? We'll move on to verse 58. So, also it's written, The first man, Adam, a living soul, was made. The last Adam, life-given spirit. He's making us a contrast between one and the other. But the spiritual is not first, but the animal, then the spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man, who is the Lord, is from heaven. Look at how he is comparing. There are two men, one on the earth and the other in heaven, which is the earthly. Such also are the earthly, and which the heavenly, such also are the heavenly. And just as we have brought the image of the earthly, 
will also bring the image of the heavenly. But this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will be changed. We all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will be sounded, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and will be transformed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And when this is corruptible, if he has clothed himself with incorruption, and this is deadly, if he has clothed himself with incorruption, he has clothed himself with incorruption, if he has clothed himself with incorruption, so then the word that is written will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Where well, all that are you still? Where are you? Where is the grave of your victory? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. More thanks to be God who give us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and steadfast, growing in the Lord's word always, knowing that the work in the Lord is not in vain. If you notice, this comparison is continually being made between Christ and Adam. It places us in a question that unconsciously already poses us to us. If with the first man enters sin, and with the second the heavenly, who is Christ, comes life given, could it be that there is a direct relationship between the time that Adam passed without sinning and the year and the years in which Christ lived on earth? Could it be that all that room for maneuver without Adam's sin was going to be the same on that Jesus had to travel? Thirty-three and a half years, one without sin and the other as well. But in the end, right, in thirty-three and a half, does one sin and the other doesn't? It's in Christ. If we know that um, can sustain it, it, it will help us determine exactly at what point in history place the entrance of sin and at what moment in history the return of Christ. This is going to be a primary basis for what we are going to look at today. Now we'll pass images for us to see. Can we change the image please? We'll see something that we need to understand once again as we have presented in the other videos. The light on the moment of Christ's return has been progressively and more detailed. We've seen two previous videos of two different people, two pastors. Today we're going to look at someone else. The biblical story of the time of the date of Christ's return, but with a different pastor. Pastor Umberto Fierro is this gentleman that you see here you can see that he is the oldest of all those we have presented so far the most veteran of the pastors he's Colombian and you know I have to tell the truth if I identify myself with a pastor today for all his clarity and the issues he's exposing and that at least I have seen on this specific subject I can't say about other topics that I don't know about him, but on this I agree perfectly with him. And you know, for me, it, this is very important because this gentleman is a veteran of the church, a gentleman of the old, the pioneers, of the closest to the pioneers. And this already has a great weight, at least for me, because you know, as they say so many times in the biblical text, what are we reminded of? What does Ellen Weiss also tell us? Why does the key in the above is the truth? When we have been worn out by the passing of the years, we have been softening, we have also been altering the messages consciously or unconsciously. We forget the fundamentals of our pioneers and we forget the biblical texts and the quotes from Ellen White 
that shed so much light on this matter. Well, it's time to recover all that was lost, because the third Elijah has to take care of recovering the lost things. The true basis of what we are to preach in the last time, and of how we are to live. And so, for the fourth angel's message, has to take all of this, retrieve it, and release it again, so that Adventists and not Adventists will know it. What are we going to see today is precisely a video of a preaching, as I have told you before, made in PowerPoint by this pastor, Umberto Fierro, the title, How Many Years Did Adam Live in Holiness? and presented by my brother, both my blood and faith, Joseph San Vicence. I know some of you already saw it at the time when he did this preaching, but I'm also aware that when there, when there are people linked to a ministry or to a small church here locally, they make a theme. Perhaps they're not seeing if they do not fit into the dynamics of the series of the Great Deception or of this type of preaching. Therefore, I wanted to recover the entire video. It doesn't last long. It's only about six, 26 minutes, but I think it's worth paying attention to all the approach he shows, and you'll see that there are some quotes that are key to understanding this. I really liked an experience I had with the first elder of the church in Girona. He was one of the people who was involved in my being expelled from the church but we still have a very good friendship, thanks God. And when, we, when he called me some time ago on the phone, before my brother began to deal precisely with these issues, because it was precisely this brother, the one who told my, bl my blood brother, that Pastor Umberto Fierro existed, because we didn't even know that he existed and that he presented topics about the date of Christ's return. He asked me, how many years do you think Adam lived in holiness or lived without sinning? I said, 33 and a half years. How do you know? Well, by logical deduction, by biblical text, and by quotes from Ellen White. It was to be expected that if 33 and a half years passed from Jesus without sinning, Adam, if he was the second Adam Christ, Adam should have gone through the same thing, because he had to be or go through the same thing, and show that from there he could also go on with without singing. Well, it made me or caused me great joy that he, this one also studying this first day of the Church of Girona, is studying these subjects, those of with total credit that they are true, and also that he also supports the date that in the year 2031 Jesus is going to return because he says so because he also found it in biblical gene genealogies etc so I'm very happy right now because more people even those who supported me leaving the church have come to realize these truths so you see how happy I can be thanks God but I'm not going to dwell any longer Stay tuned from the beginning to the end of this preaching because it's really worth it. It's really worth it. Let's watch the video. We have always wondered when did Adam sin? Did he sin right after the law created him? After a week? After a few hours? After a few years? Well, this PowerPoint will tell us in a logical way when Adam gave, gave in to sin, lost his holiness, back in the Garden of Eden. I would also like to point out to you, in this PowerPoint, there are a few photographs. There are some that would not correspond to our faith. St. Jesus is presented with the areola on his head, and this is not adequate. I don't know how this man happened to him. I don't know if maybe someone made like a falsification. I don't know, but it's there. I mean, so that later you don't find any doubts, all right? So it's being a mistake that this one is a mistake. But let's look at the message that this PowerPoint 
wants to give to each of to each of us. Before I start, I'd like you to read with me two passages which we find in Romans chapter five, the first of them. We're going to look at verses fourteen and seventeen and eighteen. It says Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even in those who didn't sin after the manner of Adam's transgression, who is a type of him who was to come. For if death reigned through the transgression of one man, much more will then reign in life of one, through one man, Jesus Christ, who received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, so that as by transgression of one came condemnation to all men, in the same way, by the righteousness of one came to all men the justification of life. I mean, here he's talking to us, it seems to be about two Adams, right? It speaks of the first Adam with whom transgression entered, and it seems to speak to us of another man with whom host whom justification came. Huh? Let's read another passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 and 47. So, it's written, The first Adam was made a living soul, and the last Adam, the second Adam, a life-given spirit. 47 tells us, The first man is of the earth, earthly, the second man, who is the Lord, is of heaven. That is to say, here he clarifies there's two Adams, one the earthly one, the one that God created at the beginning, but then there's another who says it's the Lord. Who was the Lord? Jesus, right? Well, having said that, we see that here is a comparison between two Adams. So let's read who tells us now this PowerPoint regarding all this. Change. Can you change, please? All right, good. How many years do Adam live in holiness? This is an unknown that is hidden between the verses of Genesis 2 from 7 to 25, which is the moment of the creation of man. Yes, perhaps you um, and I have asked ourselves this question many times. I have asked myself many times, and we've argued many times with many brothers. The answer is found in the life of the second Adam. For Christ came not only to die for us, but also to answer many questions like this. How many years did Adam live in holiness? Join me and together we'll find out. That is to say, the answer to this question is found in the second Adam, not in him, not in the first Adam. Huh? That's interesting. God's Word tells us how we came into being and who created us. Here we see some photographs as the Lord creates man in it from the clay of the earth. Huh? Genesis 1 26 27 says, Then said God, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, and the birds of the air, and the cattle, and all the earth and on every beast that moves on the earth. So, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Notice that the text mentions three times that man was created in the image of God. This refers to the physical part, and once it mentions that he was created in the likeness of God, which refers to the spiritual part of God, that is, it seems that the Lord has the same form as us. Yes, these numbers come out there, right? But there is also another issue. The spiritual part, reasoning, which is what the human being has with distinction over the rest of creation. We see here some illustrations of how the beginning the creation was. Man was to bear the image of God, 
both in outward likeness and character, always eternally, according to Patrix and Prophet on page 25. The image of God, external and internal, in both senses. Genesis 2, 8 and 9 tells us, And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and put there the man whom he had formed. Jehovah God caused all kinds of trees to sprout out of the earth, attractive to the eye and good to eat. In the preparation of man's wondrous abode, attention was paid to ornament as well as to utility. That is to say, God prepared a beautiful garden to look at, magnificent, beautiful, but also useful. Every species of vegetation was provided that could serve to supply a man's needs and also for his enjoyment. Flowers, trees and shrubs regale your senses with their fragrance Delight your, your eyes with their exquisite shapes and enchanting colouring and satisfy your palate with a delicious fruit. What would not Eden be like and the fruits that were there? I imagine that I love fruit, but the fruit of today I imagine that it would not be, it mustn't be like the fruit of yesterday, the original fruits, because if we deteriorate it, surely the the diet too, and a lot, and a lot, because all this was enjoyed by the first couple. Genesis two sixteen seventeen says, and the Lord God commanded man, saying, "You may eat from all the trees into the garden, from all of the trees, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, shall you surely pass away; you die." Not instantly. But over time, I would see the results in your flesh. We can say that Adam was rich in the sense that he had everything he, had everything he needed to supply his needs. In Eden, there were all kinds of fruit trees that delighted the palate. We look at creation, how God prepares everything, the whole stage. And when everything is ready, then he puts man there. He doesn't create man in a vacuum but he puts him already in a prepared home. In addition, he says that they enjoy the daily visits of the Creator, with whom they converse face to face and thus spend their lives in full harmony with God until he violated God's commandment. The Lord said to him, But you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. Genesis 2.25 tells us, And they were both naked, Adam and his wife, and they were not ashamed, they were naked, and they did not know why the spirit of prophecy says that there was like a hollow of light that enveloped them, and they didn't see their nakedness. But when what came up, came up, that hollow disappeared, and they realized they were naked. His holiness was reflected in his garments of innocence. The question is, how long did Adam remain in perfect harmony with God's will? It says that Jesus went to talk to them every day, every day. How long did this circumstance last? Do you know? we have to go back to the time of Christ's birth and death on the cross. At the time of birth, one, and at the time of the death, two, to know how long Adam was without sinning. What happened 4,000 years after the creation of the world? What do we see here? A photograph of a baby, of a manger, right? Excerpted from the Adventist Bible Commentary on Volume 5, page 231, the following. The year 5 
before Christ can be considered to be approximately correct to mark the birth of Christ. 4,000 years before creation, I'm sorry, 4,000 years after creation of the world. That is, it is estimated that around the year 5, year 4, more or less around that, before the Christian era, Christ came into the world. And he says that from there, it is 4,000 years to creation. Remember that Adam was created on the sixth day. So, six is whose number? Man's right. Sixth day. There is something here that in another PowerPoint we will talk the relationship of the week with the time we're living in this world. What happened for thousand years after Adam's sin? Selected Messages, Volume 1, page 313. Here Christ won in place of the sinner for thousand years after Adam turned his back on the light of his home. That is, when Adam turned his back on the light of his home, that is, when Adam sinned, 4,000 years began to be reckoned that reached how far? To Christ on the cross. Here we see the expulsion with the angel with the flaming sword got in the way to Eden. Conflict of the ages tell us on page 375 with a great sacrifice offered at Calvary. Here ended the system of offerings that for 4,000 years had prefigured the Lamb of God. 4,000 years, 4,000 years to birth. From creation to birth and 4,000 years from the fall to the crucifixion of Jesus. First sacrifice, when did it happen? Genesis 3.21 Genesis 3.21 Do we read this passage? Genesis 3.21 Here is noted the first sacrifice that had to be made. The text says, And the Lord God made the man and his wife robes of skins and clothed them. Where do I get the fur robes? An animal possibly a lamb, had to be sacrificed, which was the symbol of Christ. And from then he dressed the first couple, as soon as they sinned. Hmm. There the first sacrifice was made. Let's move on. Notice that between the period of Adam, Adam's creation, and the birth of Christ, according to the Adventists, Bible commentary, 4,000 years elapsed, and from the time of Adam's sin and the first sacrifice was made in Eden to Christ's death on the cross, as recorded in the Great Controversy, 4,000 years also passed. There are key quotes, which perhaps some will want to doubt, but they are very clear about what he's telling us, the message he gives us. Let's look at the following similarity between Christ and Adam with these two periods. Let's see. Birth, crucifixion. Jesus lived how long? 33 and a half years, according to the scriptures. He was about 30 years old. He was baptized. He was baptized. Three and a half years later, in the middle of the week, out of the seventy, he was crucified. And here there are some texts that mention it, right? Now, let's look at this Adam. Adam cast out of the garden. What does he say here? According to that, it is the same period that Adam lived, thirty-three and a half years in holiness. If he was the first Adam and Jesus was the second Adam, Ellen White says that when one fell, the other triumph gave us life. 
if there was such an exact parallel between them, it means that the two lived 33 and a half years. Adam didn't live a, didn't live a week or 15 days or a year and then sin. No, 33 and a half years, just like Jesus, the second Adam. During this period, the Bible tells us that Adam and Eve lived in the midst of absolute abundance, for God has caused all kinds of trees to sprout of the, out of the earth, attractive to the eye and good to eat. And I told them, you can eat from all the trees in the garden, in contrast to Adam's life in Eden. Jesus said, the Son of Man has now uh, to lay his head. Matthew 8.20 Another contrast. One had a lot of abundance, everything. The other had nowhere to lay his head. Absolutely poverty. Another contrast. Adam's sin in the midst of abundance, while Christ in the midst of poverty, was tempting, tempted in every way, just as we are, but without sin. He wasn't exactly like us, as much as some want to make it look like. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and in him there was no desire, no longing to commit sin. He had no tendency to see. I didn't have it in any way, which, which Adam didn't have either. But Adam fell. This is the image I told you before. God's plan through the Gospel is that if we accept Jesus as a Savior in the process of sanctification, step by step, He will return us to His image and likeness as Adam was in Eden. Isn't this God's desire for us that we will come to sanctification? But here and now, in this condition of sin, He says, be perfect as your Father is perfect. That is that today, in spite of the opposition of sin, we can reach perfection. Always. As they say, with that courage, with that desire, wanting to move forward, wanting to the Lord, to mold us, to do His will better. The psalmist said, Created me, O God, a pure heart, and it was said by a very sinful man, but create Create, my, create in me a pure heart. That's why he tells us, you will sanctify yourselves and be holy because I'm holy. Leviticus 11.44 And that already in Leviticus when they came out of Egypt, for without holiness no one will see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 If we aren't holy, we can't be in the presence of the Lord. What happened to that people? Do you remember when they came to Sinai? No, no, you go... He talked to the Lord. We don't want to die. We don't want to see God and die. Why? Because they knew they weren't holy. But Moses, who was a meek man, a man who was sanctifying himself, was able to be in the presence of the Lord. What is the secret for you and me to remain in holiness? Like Adam... 33 and a half years old, Hebrews 12 2 says, Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Christ never sinned, because every day we, he kept his gaze fixed on his heavenly Father. That was the secret. But it may be ours. He says, He's our mother, right? If we learn from him, we too can be, we too can be saints, gazing each day at heaven. How many nights did Jesus spend in prayer, away from all the hustle and bustle, and whole hours, and that's what gave him the victory. He had a job here, very important to do for us, in the same way, we too have the possibility of remaining in holiness if we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, our Saviour. If remain in holiness, as she contemplated her Creator, when she set his sights on the benefits she would derive from eating a forbidden fruit, what happened? She sinned. She looked away. Instead of looking at Jesus, what did she look? Greedy, right? 
of that tree and, and she sinned. In the same way, Adam remained in holiness for th 33 and a half years. All the time he kept his eyes on his Creator, the moment he stopped looking at it and fixed his gaze on his wife, his love for her led him to it also of the fruit that God had forbidden her and fell into sin. May God bless you, is my wish and prayer. Adam lost that. His love for his wife didn't want to lose her, and he was willing to suffer the same fate that she was going to become. That's why he sinned deliberately. Who was more to blame, Eve or Adam? Either one or the other. I can't say it's not that the woman's is not that both of them. She was deceived, but he did it deliberately. That's why we can't make excuses. Sin is very gritty. It's very subtle. And it can trap us in any way we least expect. So, well, this is as far as this PowerPoint has come. As you can see, it has an overwhelming logic, those quotes that we have quoted from the conflict of the centuries, etc., 4,000 years from the creation until the birth of Christ and 4,000 years from Adam's sin until the cross. Ellen White says that this world has a lifespan of 6,000 years. How long has it been since Christ came? How much do we have fell, who we have left? When will he, will he be back for the second time? This subject is being discussed in the conferences and I think Victor is now preparing the climatic theme uh, of all so that we can know exactly when he will return. Not the day and hour, but we can know the year and even the season after year. Also, here are PowerPoints that explain that's explained. We'll, we'll, present, we'll present you that in another time. May the Lord help us then so that we may study His Word, that we may study those texts that are sometimes difficult, conflicting, doubtful, that we may study the names as we mentioned earlier in the Sabbath school, right? They have their importance. The numbers in the Bible have their importance. Three, four, six, seven. Everything has its importance. From the beginning, from the creation, the five, two, of course. From the beginning of creation to the end, everything has its importance. And there are messages for God's people today. Those who will see the return of Christ. Because I'm 55 years old, but if the Lord, but God willing, I'm going to see Christ come. If God, if God wills, of course, because I'll be on an age, so... I can still be alive. I won't be 120, 130, not, not much younger. And I'll be able to see Christ coming. Therefore, may the Lord help us to take time to study our Bible and pray and in pray. Let's wrap. Yeah, let's, let's, let's finish, right? Dear Lord, we thank you immensely because we see how you are shedding life for the time we're living in. Not only here, through Victor, through Angel and other co-workers, is the talk about the timing of your coming. But we see that around the world there are also people who are receiving this light and they are sharing it. Lord, help us to be open-minded, to be able to see this new light, this great light that you are given in this world. You know that you said that the young would dream dreams they would have visions, just as the old man would have visions. That the light would increase like the light of the dawn until the day was perfect. And we know how your Lord is giving that light, as you did in the days of the pioneers, so that the world many may awaken. Realize that we have little time left to prepare to reach this holiness, to be able to be in your presence. Lord, Help your people to wake up and help your people to do their work, given the message that touches, the message that corresponds so that others can open their minds, their eyes, 
and can accept you before it's too late. Stay with us, Lord. Help us to pray, to study your word constantly, to be more like Jesus, a mortal, and to draw closer to you every single day. Keep us on this Sabbath. Help us to keep it properly and accompany us, Lord, with each one in his homes. In Jesus' name, we ask you for everything. Amen. Well, you've seen this fantastic and phenomenal preaching in which once again we realize how important it's to be able to place in a certain historical period certain situations or certain key events in order to determine those 6,000 years of human history. Look at how everything has its correspondences. On the one hand, we have Adam with Christ, even in the years of which others experience, and on the other hand, we also have something linked to Adam, the creation. Six days on the one hand, the seventh rest, and applied at a general level in a historical process. One day at a thousand years, we're going to, what? Six thousand years of human history, and sin, and then Jesus returns. Therefore, see how the symbologies always correspond, and this once again serves to realize that we can't say, oops, it's approximately 6,000 years, it may be a few years earlier, or it may be, I don't know, many years later. No, God doesn't work like that. We see, Do we want even more evidence? Well, we're going to continue to have them, God willing. That's why the next day we're going to try, of course, with two more videos. And it's not going to be just the next day. It's going to be the next day as well. God willing. And there are going to be precisely two more themes by Pastor Umberto Fierro, which my own brother, Joseph San Vicente, was also presenting and who was already openly talking about the year 2031 as the year of Christ's return. This should make us think a lot because we're already saying that it is not just one person who's saying it. There are more people and Mr. Umberto Fierro, he doesn't know us at all that I know of. Therefore, it's to give thanks to the Lord. Thank you that he is showing a light which we need now, because it is when the return of Christ is very near. Well, without further ado, I'd like to end today's topic, of course, with a prayer of thanksgiving to the Lord. Father, if we are truly very grateful to you, but very, we are so grateful, my dear Lord, because you've granted this light when it was really needed for your people. We can be very happy. You didn't make it known to others many years ago because they will surely have been demoralized knowing that there could be still hundreds of thousands of years before your return may have made them succumb. But now that everything is getting complicated or we are seeing the end of the fulfillment of the prophecies recorded in the book of Daniel chapter 11 as well and in other texts, now is when we need, we need that solid foundation that will strengthen us to see if the signs on the one hand that you have been showing us but also to know when this will end so that we try to hurry up to give this message some people say it's all up to us to get you to come. What is certain is that you know when you're going to come back and you tell us and they're going to do that work with us or without us but everything is going to be fulfilled. It's up to us to give the message but if we don't give it someone else is going to give it for us. But you have to watch 
and you have let us know when the alarm sounds for your return and we want to ask you to help us Lord to be aware that there is little time left and we want to participate in your work there is still a lot of, a lot of fear a lot of work to be done and we want to ask you, Lord to send to send out laborers into your harvest so that we may preach more on this message and prepare by showing the people the signs that truly announce that the end is very near and that we can no longer waste time with nonsense, Lord. Help us to act Christianly, truly, to reform our lives, the things we do wrong, and to return fully to you and to proclaim this message to so many inside and outside any church so that many more will react and surrender to you, Lord. Now we have all the evidence in our hands. Help us not to waste this. What great value you give us. Forgive all our sins and pour out the Holy Spirit upon us to finish the work. And that there may be many of us who can enter into your kingdom. That we ask all this of you through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Amen.